In section 13.8, what we're going to look at is extrema of functions of two variables. We will begin this section by kind of extending the, the old school EVT uh, for a, a function of a single variable to that of a function of two variables. So a lot of the same ingredients, if you remember what the extreme value theorem said for function of a single variable, it essentially said that if you have a function that's continuous on a closed interval, um, then that function will obtain an extreme value. It'll have both a minimum and a maximum on that interval. Okay. So let's suppose we have now a function of two variables defined on a closed bounded region R in the xy plane. The values f of a comma b and f of c comma d such that f of a comma b is less than or equal to f of x comma y, which in turn is less than or equal to f of c comma d, uh, for all order pairs x comma y in the region R, then we would say that um, the function value f of a comma b, that value would be a, a minimum of f on the region R, and the output uh, f of c comma d, that function value would be the maximum of the function f on the region R. Graphically, if you were to look at this type of uh, function, it would be in three dimensions. Visually, it would correspond, to the minimum would be the lowest value uh, of the function within that bounded region, and the highest point would be the maximum of the function in that region. Okay. So this is what we have. We have the extreme value theorem. This is theorem 13.15. Let f be continuous function of two variables defined on a closed and bounded region R. That's kind of the analog of a uh, closed interval in the one-dimensional case. Then there's at least one point R at which F takes on a minimum value, and there's also at least one point R at which F takes on the maximum value. Okay. A minimum is also called an absolute minimum, and a maximum is also called an absolute maximum in that case. So here you can kind of see the, the definitions uh, for relative minimum and relative maximum. If f of x naught comma y naught is less than or equal to f of x comma y for all values x comma y in some open disk containing the point x naught y naught, then we would say that that function value f of x naught y naught would be a relative minimum. And conversely, if f of x naught comma y naught is greater than or equal to f of x comma y for all order pairs x y in that open disk containing x naught comma y naught then the function would have a relative maximum at that point x naught y naught again relatively speaking this would correspond to uh you know like either hills or kind of like valleys you would see for the graph the next thing we're going to define is that of a critical point let f be defined in an open region R containing x naught comma y naught. The point x naught comma y naught is a critical point of f if one of the following is true. So either we would need the partial of f with respect to x at the point to be equal to zero, and additionally, the partial of f with respect to y to be equal to zero at the same time, then that would be a critical point or if either of the partials doesn't exist, so if either fx or fy doesn't exist, then it would be um, a critical point as well. Condition number one is essentially just saying that the uh, gradient would be equal to zero. If you recall, del f in this case would be fxi plus uh, fyj. If both partial derivatives are simultaneously equal to zero via condition one, then essentially the, the directional derivative, uh, the gradient there, del f, would be equal to, to zero at that point. And this would imply that that function would have a horizontal tangent plane at the point x naught, y naught. Let's take a look at theorem 13.16. Relative extrema only occur only at the critical points. If f has a relative maximum at x naught comma y naught on an open region R, meaning if this is a point that's in the interior of R, then x naught comma y naught is a critical point of, of f. Okay. We want to, to kind of remember um, 
you know, the, the, the converse, just as it was in the one variable case, the converse of this, of this uh, theorem is not true. So just because uh, you might have a critical point doesn't always guarantee that that critical point will produce or yield relative extrema. However, if you do have a uh, continuous function in a uh, closed region and you're looking at an extrema within the interior of that region, then it is true that that relative extrema occurs at one of the critical points of, of F. Let's take a look at example one. They want us to determine the relative extrema of this function. It's f of x comma y equals 2x squared plus y squared plus 2x minus 6y plus 20. First thing we'd want to do is begin by finding our critical numbers. I should say, excuse me, not critical numbers. This is two variable function, critical points, that is. And again, they're going to come from two different sources. Let's look for the critical points that occur as a result of having fx and fy simultaneously equal to zero. If I take the partial of f with respect to x, fx is going to be equal to 4x plus 8. fx will be equal to 0, means that 4x plus 8 has to be equal to 0, or that x will have to be equal to negative 2. The partial of f with respect to y is going to be 2y minus 3. The partial of f with respect to y is equal to 0 when 2y minus 3 equals to 0. Excuse me, why did I get 3 there? That should be 6. That's 2y minus 6. 2y minus 6 should be equal to 0. Or in other words, when y equals 2 to 3. We want to kind of pay close attention to the, the way that this is worded. This is an AND statement, so we would need for both x to be negative 2 and y to be 3. So that gives us the critical point negative 2, comma, 3. There is another potential source for critical points, and those would be the ones where either fx is undefined or fy is undefined. So here you don't need both of them, it's just one or the other. However, both fx and fy are just polynomial uh, functions, so they're going to be defined everywhere. They won't be undefined anywhere. So we won't get any uh, critical points from the second type. Okay, that's nice. So we have a critical point. We would now want to kind of determine um, you know, exactly what's going to happen at that critical point. Does it produce a, a maximum? Does it produce a minimum? Maybe something different altogether. Maybe we don't get anything. And to, to kind of dig a little bit deeper, especially this early on, what we're going to do is kind of analyze this function f of x comma y. And we're going to do so by completing the square in the x and the y variable. So let me just kind of rewrite this function. I'm going to get all of my x terms together. Can I get all of my y terms together? And I'm just going to leave this, this plus 20 over here. Whenever we complete the square, we would prefer to have the leading coefficient be a 1. So I'm going to factor that x, that 2 out of the uh, first parenthesis. So that the x squared is a leading coefficient of 1. And now we're going to go ahead and, and complete the square. So we might recall that in order to complete the square, what we need to do is look at the coefficient of the first power term. We need to take half of that, and then we need to square it. Well, half of 4 is 2, and then 2 squared would be 4. So I need to add 4 on the inside here. Now, we can't just go you know, adding numbers uh, 
to just expressions in general, we have to make sure that things are balanced and that we don't change it in any meaningful way. And in truth, we actually added more than four. What we actually added was that four times the two that's out in front. So we actually added eight to this function. I have to compensate for that by also subtracting eight somewhere else. And I will do that with the, with the constant term. I also want to complete the square in the y variable. Its coefficient of its first power term is negative 6. I take half of negative 6 and square it. Half of negative 6 is negative 3. Negative 3 squared would be positive 9. So if I add 9 on the inside, then I need to compensate by subtracting 9 on the outside. And what this allows us to do is to rewrite f of x comma y as follows. This is going to be 2 times... This is now going to factor as the perfect square x plus 2 squared plus y minus 3 squared. And then 20 minus 8 minus 3 will give us positive 3. We look at this and we say, okay, well, what, what exactly does that tell us? Well, let's investigate. Look at the terms that have the x and the y term. Here, this term is raised to the second power, and this term is also being raised to the second power. Those quantities individually could be at a minimum of value of zero. Furthermore, when would each of them be at a value zero? Well, this thing is going to be equal to zero when x is negative two. This thing would be equal to zero when y is three. In other words, at our critical point, two comma three, that's when these two would be at their smallest, which would give us an output of 3. We can see that for any other value of x and y, these two quantities will both be, would one or the other be non-zero, and therefore we would be taking something and adding it to 3, which would make the output greater. So for all values x comma y, we see that f of x comma y would be greater than f of negative 2, comma 3, which will happen if you plug it in, that would be equal to 3. And so we have a absolute minimum at that point. So we have an absolute min of 3, and this occurs at the order pair negative 2, comma, comma 3. You can also quickly realize that this function will not have an absolute maximum by choosing either larger values of x and y, either positive or negatively, this function would approach positive infinity and therefore there would be no maximum for this one.